your Bibles and turn this morning, if you would, to the chapter in the Bible that talks about love. Valentine's Day, talking about love. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This chapter is known uh, throughout Scripture as the famous chapter that talks about love. An interesting thing that the subject of this chapter is love and talks about God's love here, but the word love is never mentioned in the chapter. <laughs> Isn't that something? And uh, it's because the word is used charity. And uh, I'll talk about that in a few moments, but let's begin reading in verse number 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse number 8. I want to preach on this subject today, the power of charity. The power of charity. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. The Bible says, Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Here again is this uh, <clears throat> chapter in Scripture that is the chapter that talks about love. But the word charity is used. The Bible translators use the word charity and love interchangeably. Because this love that the Bible talks about here comes from the root word, which we know as agape. It's a Greek word, agape, which means and talks about God's love. God's love is a giving love. When you think about charity, you think about giving. And, uh, you know, it's like at Christmas time when you go into stores and you, before you enter the store, you see the bell ringer standing there ringing the bell and he has his red pot there and, and uh, he's ringing the bell. Why? Because for the Salvation Army, he wants you to put some money in there to help where the Salvation Army helps in disasters or people that are um, that are uh, uh, poor and, and need help and those type of things, they help. So when you go up there to put money in there, in that little pot that's hanging there with the bell ringer, I wish they had different tones of bells. I get sick of the one, I wish they had a couple different tones, just the you know, variety, you know what I mean? Instead of the same, clang, clang. But anyhow, it gets your attention. Amen? Yeah. And you drop some money in there, nothing wrong, that's good. But when you put that money in there, as you enter into Walmart, you don't expect that person that's ringing the bell to give you anything for that money. You give it out of a heart of charity. No. You give it out of a heart of love. Now, when you walk into Walmart and you pick up some things in the store, you don't just walk out of the store without paying, right? You expect that when you pay the money at Walmart, you're gonna bring your things home. But not out front with the guy with the kettle. You're giving that to them as charity. This is the kind of love that the Bible is talking about in this chapter. It's charity type of love. It's the love that you give not expecting anything in return. I want you to get that. And I want you to think of that as we talk about love today and the power of love or the power of charity. Another word that's used there for agape that we could kind of use to define it today is benevolence. Benevolence, a gift, giving something. This word is translated charity that in this chapter is used in three different ways in the New Testament. We find this word love or charity in the New Testament. Three different ways. Number one is this. It's to describe the attitude of God toward his son. God loves his son. 
He loves the human race. God's attitude toward the human race in a general way. God loves the world. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. This, this is that type of love that we find in 1 Corinthians 13 that says charity, giving love. God loves the world. His attitude, God's attitude toward believers, uh, especially toward believers and those that are born again, born into his family, um, his love toward us is a giving type of love. And then also it's used in a second way, and that is to convey his will to his children concerning their attitude one toward another and to all men. You know, the Bible says that we are also to love others. The Bible tells us that. The Bible tells us we are to love others. And we are to love them with this kind of godly love, not expecting anything in return, just giving love away. That's really the love a Christian ought to have for others. Amen. Uh, why do I want my neighbor to come to church and trust Christ to be saved or my relative or my friend? Because I love them. I love them with this godly love. And I want them to know Jesus Christ as I know him. Amen. And receive his love as I've received his love. And I know the change that will take place if they will reach back to the Savior who's already reaching out to them Amen. and receive this love. This is God's love, and this is what the Bible talks about. The third way also <clears throat> that it talks about is to express the essential nature of God. If you want to know more about God, you have to understand this. The Bible tells us God, <clears throat> excuse me, God is love. Amen? Amen. God is love love. He, he is, his very nature is love, and, and uh, we can't understand love until we understand a little bit more about God. Amen. God is love. So we see this given in scripture in so many different times and ways. In the context of the surrounding chapters here, around chapter 13, the Apostle Paul is dealing with spiritual gifts. If you look back at uh, <clears throat> chapter 12, You'll see that he is talking about that. Look at chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts. This church in Corinth, <clears throat> excuse me, had a problem about recognizing spiritual gifts in the right way. And so he, he, here in this chapter 12, he's talking about spiritual gifts. And then he comes to chapter 13, and he puts that right in the middle here. And then in chapter 14, notice chapter 14, verse 1. He says, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. So he's talking about spiritual gifts before this chapter, and he's talking about spiritual gifts after this chapter. Right in the middle is this chapter about love. It's sandwiched right here in the middle. Why is that? Why is that? Well, I think it really describes itself in the very first verse where it says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, godly love, that giving love, I am become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. I can have all the spiritual gifts. I can possess all the spiritual gifts. But if I don't have love in my heart, it's like sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. In other words, it's kind of annoying without love. Amen. It's just kind of annoying without love. If somebody gets up and preaches a, a great message or, or somebody um, that, that has a spiritual gift and, and, and you admire that, but they don't have any love in their heart, love for God or love for others, it kind of diminishes it, makes it look like, you know, I mean, it's just like can be annoying without love in your heart. This is what he's talking about. Paul was showing them that love is a necessity no matter what your gifts are or how many gifts you exhibit without love, it doesn't mean anything. You might have a spiritual gift. You might be gifted in certain ways. God gives you that gift anyhow. Amen. It comes from him. Amen. I remember some years ago when I pastored in Canada, we had a young man, we had a 
actually a, a, a young man and his younger sister that came and they came from a family and they were from Eritrea. Some pronounce it Eritrea. I don't know which is proper, but anyways, that's what I say, Eritrea, which is near Ethiopia in Africa. He was a tall young man. He was about, I don't know, about 15 years old and tall and and uh, he, he was very knowledgeable. I mean, he, he was a smart guy. And we went to a youth activity with several churches that were there. And he came with us and was a faithful member of our church at the time. He came with us. And uh, part of the youth activity, they were, you know, having some fun and doing some funny things. And, and the guy that was the director of the youth activity, he said, I want... Uh, any teenager to come up here on the platform and do something that nobody else can do. Wow, that opens it up to a lot of weird things. <laughs> I mean, there was guys, you know, a, a guy had, I don't know, he's double jointed, bring his fingers back and touch him back here like this. And I mean, there was some, you know, weird things there. I looked at that crowd, I didn't know there were so many freaks in the crowd. You know what I mean? Like weird things happening. And he got up and came up. And he said, well, what can you do that nobody else here can do? He said, I can say John 3, 16 in five languages. And I, I was like, I didn't know that. I was like, well, what if, you know, and when he went up there, I thought, why is he going up there? He said, I can say it in English and uh, his tribal language. I, I don't know what it was called. I think it was, the other language was Urdu and then Arabic. He could speak Arabic and something else. I don't even remember. And so he started quoting John 3, 16 in each one of those five different languages. Wow, you know, as a, as a young man, about, I don't know, about 15, 16 years old, that is a gift. That really is to be able to do that in all those different languages is a gift. Now, if he'd go around and brag about the fact that he had all this ability to quote scripture in all these different languages, but didn't have any love in his heart for others, what is it? What good is it? You see here, the Apostle Paul is talking about this, and he comes in chapter 13. Most of the time when I or other preachers preach on chapter 13, you would see the first, the first, uh, you know, six, seven, eight verses used. But I'm going to start this message in verse number eight and cover the last half of this chapter. I want you to notice, first of all, my first point of my message is this. It is unfailing. It is unfailing. This, this kind of love, this charity love, the power of this charity love is it is unfailing. Look at verse 8. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now what he is doing here in this verse is showing and comparing the permanent with the temporary. The temporary, you might say, is a worldly type of love. Not God's love. Aren't you glad today, if you're here today and you know Christ is your Savior, aren't you glad that this type of love, God's love for us, never ends? Amen. Amen. We can be with Him in heaven for a million years and God still loves us. Amen. Thank God for that. It is a permanent love. We see around the world today a lot of temporary love. You know, I heard, a, I heard one time on television this couple getting married and the 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 uh, whoever he was judge or preacher or whatever that was marrying them said in the vows for as long as we both shall love instead of for as long as we both shall live he changed it to love you know what love he was talking about not this in chapter 13 not God's love, not biblical love, because love never, this charity never faileth. You know what? He was giving both of them an out. They had some physical attraction, some worldly love that we call lust for each other. They were getting married. But you know what? That's temporary. It's not going to last. That's right. It's not going to last. It's going to fail. 
And he gives in this list, <clears throat> he gives some of the, some of the um, <clears throat> a gift, spiritual gifts here. But this love, it, it, let, let me deal with this. This love he's talking about, verse 8, charity never faileth. That giving type of love never faileth is a permanent thing. It cannot fail. It will continue. Dr. Morris, a, a, a preacher of years gone by, said it this way. It is a love for the utterly unworthy. A love which proceeds from a God who is love. It is a love lavished upon others without a thought of whether they are worthy to receive it or not. Hey, when the Bible says God so loved the world. God could look down in the future and see you and me and say already, before we're even born, I love them. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing, but that's God's love. And this charity, the Bible says, this charity never faileth. It will never suffer ruin. It'll never pass away. When you love someone, even though they may not love you, and you just continue to love them, what's going to stop that? You can't stop that. It won't fail. It just continues on. But notice these other things that he compares it to in the rest of the verse that are temporary. They are unstable things. He said, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. You know what prophecies are? Prophecies are spiritual gifts. To be able to foretell. We can foretell today and we can prophesy by what the Bible says. When a preacher preaches what the Word of God says. I did quite a bit of prophesying here last year or so when I talked through the book of Revelation. Why? Because I was talking about future events and prophesying those future event events because that's what God's Word says. But he said that type of spiritual gift, he says they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. That's the gift of languages. Being able to speak languages. Hey, folks, by the way, we're not going to be we're not going to need to speak all kind of other languages when we get to heaven. Amen. Amen? That's right. That's going to cease. That gift is going to cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. The Bible says when we get to heaven, we shall know as we are known. Uh, we're going to be knowledgeable when we get to heaven. Right now we have to work at it. To gain knowledge. Amen. And some have an easier uh, place. I know because I teach over there at the college. Boy, it is really hard. Because I want to challenge those that are, you know, that grasp it easier or more intelligent. I've got, I've got some young people in my class that have grown up in church and heard these things over and over again. I want to challenge them. But also in my class, I have some that haven't been saved very long. And they're new to things, and they don't grasp things as quickly. And I, I'm trying to make it so that they can understand and learn, and so that they can all they can all learn something from the class that I'm teaching. You know, you know that. I mean, I I remember when I was a kid in school, I I had trouble with reading some areas. Math came to me easy, but uh, you know, trouble with reading and spelling and English and oh, English, oh. It's the craziest language in the world. Here's all these rules that you have to learn. But here's the exceptions. Here's the exception. Here's the exception. That's an exception. Oh, that's an exception. Uh, half the words in the English language are exceptions. You know what I'm saying? That about drove me crazy. Math is just 2 plus 2 equals 4 and that's it. Amen? I mean, no exceptions. That's it. Unless you go to school today... And I'm not even going to go there. All right. But these talents will fail. These spiritual gifts that God gives us. Hey, they're going to fail. They're going to pass away. We don't need them permanently. But the character of love does not fail. Charity never faileth. Amen. The youth and young people should see love in us Older people, that is more than just our talents, that is more than just a temporary thing. And young Christians need to see in more mature believers that the love of God is a permanent love. Amen. Never goes away. 
God loves me with that kind of love. And you know what? I want to love God with that same kind of love. He's never done anything to fail me. He's never done anything to make my love diminish at all. I love him because he first loved us. It is unfailing. I want you to notice, secondly, it is uncomparable. It is uncomparable. Now, <clears throat> before I go on, I look this word up. We usually say incomparable, right? But do you know uncomparable is a word? Incomparable means nothing can compare. It, it is better than all the rest, but uncomparable means about the same thing. Nothing compares to this. Plus, if I use the letter U, it fits into my outline a little bit better. So I use this word, all right? It is unfailing. Secondly, it is uncomparable. Look at verse 9. Start at verse 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Look at verse 9 through verse 12. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. It's temporary. It's just in part. Verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Again, in this comparison, he talks about these things that are temporary. We will never understand everything about God. We'll never understand everything about God. If you could ever understand all about God, then you would be God. Right? We'll never understand everything about God. When we get to heaven, uh, we'll have no need of these temporary things anymore. They may be a spiritual gift while you're here on this earth, and that will be great, especially if you're, using, if you're using your talents for the Lord, and it shows your love for Him, and that's what we ought to do. You have a talent, you ought to use it for God. You have a spiritual gift, use it to glorify His name, not to glorify yourself. Amen. That's what we should do. But he says, it's, it's temporary. Now, he goes on in verses 10 and 11, and he talks about the illustration of life. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. Now, this also compares to the Christian life. When I was first saved, a baby Christian, and I didn't, I wasn't mature in the Lord yet, I was like a child. You know, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. That was my thinking. My thinking was that way. You ever get, some, get around somebody that just recently got saved? I like to be around new Christians because they have so much zeal and usually always excited about their salvation. Hey, listen, don't lose that excitement. Amen. Amen? Are you hearing me? Right. Don't lose that excitement. Always be excited that you're saved and you get to go to heaven. Amen? Amen? Keep that excitement. But you know, I mean, here's what happens is that when we're first saved, we have that, we have that zeal and that excitement, but we don't have the knowledge we need. We don't have the knowledge we need. I remember I, you know, as a young man and and uh, we would go in my church, we'd go out and knock on doors and talk to people, and and uh, I remember getting so excited one time that you know, we knocked on this door and this person came to the door and they were, uh, they were a Jehovah's Witness and they led Bible studies of Jehovah's Witness. And I started talking to that lady and I was, uh, you know, just, you, and I had a guy with me that was younger than I was and, and, and he was all excited about taking this person on, you know, all excited about it. My goodness, that lady twisted me in so many knots, I didn't know which way was up. You know what I'm saying? And after a while, I said, well, here's what I'm here for. To give you this track and invite you to our church. Goodbye. Have a good day. And I laughed. I mean, she had me so twisted and confused. But you know what? It made me determined that to study more. And no, I was, just, I was just young. I didn't understand, didn't know these things. And she said, well, what about this? What about that? I was like, Arr. 
When I was a child, that's what you expect out of a child, don't you? Not mature, didn't know, hadn't had experience. Well, that's the way you get experience. That's the way you grow up. That's right. Hey, Christian, don't stay a child, spiritually speaking. Amen. Amen. Grow up. Grow up in the faith. Be more faithful to the house of God. Start coming to more services at church. Amen. Start reading your Bible more. And I guarantee you, you start reading the scripture more. You'll begin to understand more. The Holy Spirit will reveal more to you as you read and as you study. I mean, it's just, I, I saw that so illustrated to me. Whenever I pastored in Canada, we had a Spanish ministry. And uh, I was working in helping them because they didn't have anybody that could uh, have any music to go along with their hymn singing. And so I play the guitar. So I said, well, I'll figure out some hymns on the guitar and I'll play for you. You can have some music. So I, I was there for all of their services. Well, when I first went, I didn't know any of the songs. I mean, I could play the chords, but I didn't know the songs. They were singing and could help them along. Uh, guess what happened after three or four months? I began to understand what they were singing. In la cruz, in la cruz, do primero, in la luz. You know, I started picking up on this. That's at the cross, at the cross. In la cruz is cross. And I started understanding. Then the preacher would get up to preach and he would say, uh, turn to, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to, turn to Juan. Um, how did he say chapter? I can't remember how chapter. Capitulo or something like that. Trace. Oh, John 3. I started picking that up. And then he would say certain words and I started understanding. And I started to where I got to the place where I knew what he was preaching on. I couldn't pick up every word, but I could pick up the thought of what he was preaching on and begin to sing the hymns with them as I play the guitar and picking those things up as you went through. You know, it's the same thing when a new Christian comes to church, just keep coming. Oh, I don't, I don't get that. I don't understand, but just keep coming. You, you read the Bible. I, I don't know if I can get this. Just keep reading. You'll understand what the Holy Spirit has to reveal to you Amen. as you read. You see, when I was a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, when I matured, I put away the childish things. Put away those things. And mature, an illustration of life. Then in verse 12, he says this, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then shall I know, even as also I am known. He's talking about in this life, and then sometime, someday when we get to heaven. Our knowledge of Christ is now dim. We don't know all the things that we need to know. We do know some things. We know that he came to this earth and he lived a perfect life and he died on a cross and was buried and he rose again. That's our Savior. And we rejoice in that. But think of this. How much more you're going to know when you get to heaven. Amen. And when you see him face to face, that's where we get that song face to face with Christ my Savior. Now I know in part, I only know certain things now, but someday face to face. And I'm going to understand. It's not only face to face with our Savior, the Lord Jesus, but it's going to be this face to face with the Apostle Paul who wrote this. Amen. Aren't you excited about that? Right. Seeing the Apostle Paul face to face. We're studying on Wednesday night, Joshua. Hey, someday we'll be face to face with him. And Moses and Abraham and all of those throughout the scripture that we've read about. And, we, and, and that's exciting to me. I don't know if you're excited about that. I'm excited about that. In fact, I just could go to heaven today. That would be just fine. <laughs> wow. I shall know, and I'm going to know him. I want you to notice lastly, in verse number 13, my third point is this, it is unceasing. It is unceasing. The power of charity, this giving type of love, it is unfailing, it is uncomparable, and it is unceasing, verse 13. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity. Faith, excuse me, faith, hope, charity. These three. 
But the greatest of these is charity. The greatest is that giving type of godly love. It is unceasing. There is three things here listed that are going to last. Number one is this. Faith is going to last. Turn over with me to the book of Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. Look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. This is such a great verse of scripture. But the Bible says this. Uh, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. Notice this. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Faith. Our trust in God is such a tremendous thing. Do you trust him today? Do you live by faith? That's trusting God every step of the way. Trust him completely, totally. Notice back there in 1 Corinthians 13, he said, Now abideth faith, number one. Secondly is hope. Hope. Turn over to the book of Colossians. Turn over to the book of Colossians and look at chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And look at verse number 23. Colossians 1, 23. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, Wherefore I, Paul, am made a minister. We have hope. We have hope that Jesus is coming again. Amen? Amen. We have the hope of heaven. We have the hope of our sins being forgiven. The hope of the gospel. Our anticipation for God uh, is, is an everlasting thing. We know that God's in control. Faith and hope. They're great things. I've preached a lot of sermons on those two words. And then he says charity. This is our imitation of God. It's a commendable thing. This type of love ought to be in us. Faith, our trust in God is a tremendous thing. Hope, our anticipation for God is an everlasting thing. Charity, our imitation of God is a commendable thing. God's love ought to be in our hearts for others. What does he say at the very end of this chapter? But the greatest of these is charity. The greatest of these is charity. The greatest asset we have in life is love. Without love, you're, you're just not going to make it. You're not going to last. You've got to have love. Love in your heart for following God and doing what he says Love in your heart because he first loved you. I hope you see this morning how much God loves you. And if you've never been saved, never been born again, how could you turn down that type of love? He loves you. He doesn't expect anything in return. He just loves you. Amen. What you need to do is respond to that love and come by grace and faith and trust him as Lord and Savior and be born again. Trusting him completely. Hey, listen, what causes the preacher to keep preaching? It's this kind of love. What causes the soul winner to keep witnessing for Christ? It's this kind of love. What causes the worker to keep on working for the Lord? It's this kind of love. What, what keeps the missionaries out there on the field, away from their homes, but preaching the gospel? It's this kind of love. Amen. God help us Amen. to have this kind of love in our hearts. Amen. For all that he's done for us.